Christmas time. Uh, we've been doing this series uh, devoted to Christmas, answering the questions on why. Why did Jesus come? And, 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 and one of the reasons that Jesus came was to be here. He came to be here, to be with us, to be among us. And I love Christmas. Christmas is so much fun, especially when you have kids. Come on, you, you kind of relive your childhood, man. As, as a kid, we can all, all have memories and moments that, that are etched in our heart forever. But when you have kids, you kind of get to relive some of those moments, and, and it's a blast, and, and just, you know, one of, one of the great joys of the whole year is getting together and watching your kids celebrate Christmas, and whether it's singing a song or opening presents is such a joy to, to watch our kids. One of the other great joys of being a parent is being able to name your kids. I don't know about you, but uh, I had the name, especially for our son Judah, picked out long before uh, Leslie and I were married when I, was a, when I was a teenager, when I first came to the Lord. I was like, I want to name my, my, my son Judah because that means the praise of God. And I want that to be the declaration over our life. And, and so that's one of the great joys of parenting. How many of you are already have, you don't have children yet, but you already have names picked out? Uh, especially the ladies, and uh, and many of us, when we when we have children or we find out we're pregnant, but that's you know, that's the first thing. What are we going to name this child? And it's a great joy. There's a lot of a lot of pleasure attached to it, but there's also a lot of pressure attached to naming a kid because we want to get that right, right? You want to get the name of your kid right because you know that that's, that can often become the the laughing stock of of the school, right? How many of y'all had a name that kind of people, man, kids are mean. They can they can come up with nicknames for anything, and uh, you know I I had all the all the fun little names uh, towards me. So picking names is critical, uh, and we also understand that there's power in your name, right? We understand that when when someone declares your name, they're they're speaking over your life every time they say that whatever your name means, they're speaking that over our life. And so there's a lot of a lot of pleasure and a lot of pressure when naming kids. And we think about Joseph and Mary, they didn't have the pleasure nor the pressure of naming this baby, but we know that this name that we speak is the greatest name. Come on, it's the name above all other names. Right? It's the name that angels sing. It's the name that causes demons to flee. It's the name that, sees, that, that, that causes disease to cease. It's the name that comforts the broken. It's the name that ushers peace into chaos. It is the name Jesus. And when we declare that name of Jesus, we are declaring his identity, but we found ours. And I love that so much about the name of Jesus that whenever I declare his name, whenever I declare his identity, I'm actually speaking over mine. I'm speaking over my identity. I speak over my identity that I'm healed whenever I'm sick because Jesus is the healer. Come on, I, I speak his name because he's the prince of peace. Whenever my situation, my circumstance isn't peaceful, I usher him into it by just the mention of his name. So when I speak the name of Jesus, I'm speaking of his identity, but I discover mine. And I love that so much. And so when we look at the story of, Mo, of, of Mary and Joseph, whenever the name Jesus comes to them, again, they recognized who he was. They didn't get the privilege of naming him. And, and it says this, an angel, and we, the, the kids read it just a few moments ago, Matthew chapter 1, verse 20. An angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. Joseph, son of David, the angel said, don't be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, for the child within her was conceived by the Holy Spirit, and she will have a son, and you will give him the name or name him Jesus, for he will save the people from their sins. And we talked about that in week one, that that is the primary purpose that Jesus came. Jesus came as the rescuer to rescue humanity from their sins. Verse 22, all of this occurred to fulfill the Lord's message through the prophets. Look, verse 23, the virgin will conceive a child and she will give birth to a son and they will call him Emmanuel which means God with us. So his name is Jesus, but he will also be called Emmanuel. There will be a title. It will be one of the things about Jesus. One of the roles that Jesus will fulfill is that God is with us. Emmanuel. God is with us. It's not just a song that we sing. It's not just a title we carry it, it is, it, or that he carries. It is a declaration saying God is here now. He's here. He's not far away. He's present. And I would encourage you not just to say the name Emmanuel. 
during Christmas. Don't just say it during Christmas. Say it whenever the, ch- the, 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 the bill comes in the mail and it's higher than you expected. Come on, declare God is with us even when the news that I got wasn't very good. Even when it feels like God isn't with me, I can say, Emmanuel, God is with us, knowing that he is present, he is here, he is among us, and he is inside of us. How many know that he didn't just come so that we could have a home in heaven? He came so he could have a home on the earth. And that home on the earth is inside of you, and it's inside of me. We carry the presence of Jesus. Jesus, listen, wherever you are, Jesus is there. And it's not just because he's omnipresent and he's everywhere. No, no, no. It's, he's also there because he is inside of you and you represent him. So when we say God is with us, there's some things that we can expect to have because he's here now. Because he is here, number one, you can expect residing hope. Everybody say residing hope. Residing hope, a hope that lives, that resides there. Listen, when we talk about hope, we're not talking about wishful thinking, Right? Come on, that's, most of the time we say hope. What do you hope for? I hope for a million dollars. No, no, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about hope. That could be, that's wishful thinking. There's a difference between hope and wishful thinking. Hope, hope is the favorable and confident expectation of good. Hope is what your children are doing when you're reading the Christmas story Tuesday morning. I hope you read the Christmas story before you open presents. Come on, get some presents before you have the presents. Come on. Have a little church before you open those presents with your kiddos and break out Luke chapter 2 and read it over your kids for just two or three minutes. But they won't be thinking about it. <laughs> Come on. They're thinking about something else. They're thinking, what is, we have a, we have a present. We, have a, we haven't pulled our presents out because we have a cat and a four-year-old, so we know that they'll all get open. So, but we wrapped them this weekend, and we have one that's a tube that's about six foot tall, and, it's, and so they're going to be wondering what's in it. They're going to have joyful, hopeful expectation of good. What is in there? What is coming? It's joyful. It's not dreaded. So normally when we use the word hope, we attach dread with it. Oh, it's not good. I hope everything turns out okay. No, no, no. That is not hope, beloved. Hope is saying, I know that good is coming. I wonder how it's going to come. I wonder what it's going to look like. That is hope. And because he is here, we can have residing hope. You can always be hopeful. So get your hopes up. We have a thing that we say, well, just, just kind of, you know, keep your, keep your hopes slow when your prayer is high or something like that. No, 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 you need to keep your hopes up. Keep your hopes up. See, hopelessness, listen, hopelessness cannot exist in his presence. Jesus is hope. It's who he is. And so there cannot be, there can be, feel, listen, there can be feelings of hopelessness, but hopelessness is an illusion. And I would say this, hopelessness is a lie. Colossians 1.27 says this, that Christ in you, the hope of glory. He is the hope of glory. And because he is inside of you, you always have hope. You carry hope. You're a carrier of hope. When you walk into a quote-unquote hopeless situation, guess what? Hope just showed up. Because you showed up. And wherever you go, he goes. Because Christ in you, the hope of glory. I love the Passion Translation of this verse. It says, living within you is Christ who floods you with the expectation of glory. The mystery of Christ embedded within us becomes a heavenly treasure chest of hope filled with the riches of glory for his people. And God wants everyone to know it. He wants you to know it. He wants you to experience hope. He wants you to know hope. When we talk about hope, we're not talking about something that floats, right? Hope don't float, it soars. Come on, hope don't float, hope don't come and go. Hope is permanently residing inside of you. That's when we say resides, we're saying it has residence inside of you. This is the thing with God. He's a stay-at-home dad. God's a stay-at-home dad. He's not a, some of you treat God like he is a nights and weekends God. Some of you have your one and a half hour visitation with God at church. That's all you got. It's not because God's visiting you. It's because you're visiting God. (laughs) Because he didn't send Jesus to give visitation rights. He sent Jesus to give inhabitation rights. 
He doesn't want another visitation. Lord, visit us, visit us. He doesn't want to visit. He wants to inhabit. He wants to continually dwell there because where he is, there is hope. He will never leave. He will never forsake permanent residence inside of us. See, that same hope that Mary carried now carries us. The same hope that Mary carried now carries us. She carried Jesus as a a six-pound, eight-ounce baby Jesus, right? You carry the King of kings and the Lord of lords inside of you, the presence of Jesus abiding. That will be what carries your life. Not because you've got the right education or the right upbringing or because you behave properly this week. No, no, no. Because Christ in you, the hope of glory, God is with us. Emmanuel, he is with you. Hope is here. Number two, you can expect sustaining peace. Everybody say sustaining peace. Say it the proper way, not the way I just said it. Sustaining peace. Sustaining peace. The, 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 the peace that says that, that, that the scriptures talk about how that, that it's a peace that transcends, that goes beyond all understanding. The comfort of knowing regardless of what's going on, on the outside, I'm okay on the inside. Regardless of the chaos on the outside, I can have peace in the inside. It doesn't matter how bad it gets out there. I'm good in here. It doesn't mean that everything's going to be okay around you, but it does mean that you're going to be okay. Because inside of you is the Prince of Peace. The peace that makes all things right. Isaiah 9, 6, for a child is born to us, a son is given to us, the government, the kingdom will rest on his shoulders and he will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. We did a series on this uh, last Christmas, each, each one of these words. And his government, I love what it says, it says his government and peace will never end. See, beloved, if you're trusting your peace to a time frame in your life, you've missed what peace is all about. Well, whenever I get that raise, whenever I get married, whenever I get pregnant, beloved, there is a peace that goes beyond every situation and every circumstance because you are in his kingdom and it will never end. It's timeless peace. It's peace that endures every difficult doctor report, every difficult phone call, text message that you get. It's a peace that sustains you through it all. It will never end because he is here. And number three, we can expect everlasting connection. Say everlasting connection. He is here. He is here. He is here now. And he is staying forever. He's not going anywhere. And you have that connection. Again, it's not just a few moments that we share together on Sunday or during the week at a Bible study or even a 20-minute devotional time that you have. No, no, no. There is a connection that is through it all, through the ups and downs of life, through the heartaches, through the good, through the bad, through it all, the everlasting connection. Hebrews chapter 8, verse 10 speaks of the new covenant, which we talked about a few weeks ago. And the new covenant says this, that I will be their God. I will belong to the people. Did you know that you don't just belong to God? God belongs to you. I will be their God. And they will be my people. This is a relationship. This is an eternal connection. And they will not need to teach their neighbors, nor will they need to teach their relatives saying, you should know the Lord. In other words, you're not going to need to have someone to have a relationship with God for you. See, a relationship with God has zero to do with how much time you spent in church or whether your parents raised you in church or not. Thank God if they did raise you in church because you learned a lot of great things. But it's one thing to know a lot of great things about God. It's another thing to know God. And he doesn't want you to just have information about him. 
He wants you to have revelation of Him. He wants you in connection with Him. He wants to talk to you. It's normal for you to hear the voice of God. It's normal for you not to have to sort through all the junk to go, what is God saying? It's normal for you to know Him. Not because you've had good teaching. You need good teaching. But you won't know Him because of good teaching. You'll know Him because you have the power to have a relationship. Because you have a connection with Jesus. You do. Not just me. Not just your pastor. Not just the worship team that leads you. That's great. We love you. We'll, we'll help get you there. We'll help get you to the starting line. But, but this is your race. This is your connection. This is your phone call. For everyone from the least to the greatest will know me. They'll know me already. See, the reality is, is this. Jesus wants to find a home in your heart. He wants you to understand that he's here, that he ain't leaving. He, he wants you to have a place in your heart, in your life for him. Some of you, you need to make that decision today. Jesus, I want you at home in my heart. And some of you who've been serving the Lord and you know the Lord, you want the Lord to be more at home in your heart. Have you ever been into a home and you kind of felt at home, but you weren't, didn't really feel at home enough to take your shoes off or to go and open the pantry? Right? I'm talking about really being at home. See, he didn't come to make earth his dwelling place. He came to make us his dwelling place. The place where he abides. Jesus said, you will abide in me and I will abide in you. I will remain. I will live here. I will mean no. I will remain in you. I will live in you. I will live in your life. You will live your life in me and I will live my life in you. We will have this everlasting connection because I'm here. Listen, the greatest gift Jesus could ever give you was his life. The greatest gift you can give him is yours. The greatest gift you can give God, is it your talents? Is it your money? Is it your words? It's your life. Lord, it's your greatest gift. I will give you my back. Years ago, I had a, a spiritual son that was getting married and and I couldn't go to his wedding. And I'm sure he was really troubled. I was kind of troubled that I couldn't go. And so I decided to get him a gift card for his wedding. To, I wanted to invest in his home. I wanted to invest in his marriage. So we went to the best place to get gift cards for at Target. And we got him a gift card. And I wrote the amount on there and wrote his name on the card. And had it all packaged and ready. And probably even put it in an envelope. And set it in that envelope, and I text him. I said, hey, man, I'm so sorry. I can't come to your wedding. I really want to be there. I can't make it. And I said, will you, will you give me your address? I have something I want to send you. Nothing. No response. Weeks go by. Hey, man, I have this something I want to send you. I have a gift I want to bless you with. And nothing. No response. No response. I feel like that this is the same way that we are with the gift that God has provided in Jesus. There's no response. There's no response. And the Lord is saying, will you just respond to the gift that I've prepared for you? I just want the place of your heart.